What exactly is the New California Movement, and what are the grievances it's trying to address? And how does this highlight the urban and rural divide among voters in California? Are there precedents for forming a new state out of a pre-existing one? And how is the New California Movement relying on the U.S. Constitution to achieve this? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Today we sit down with Paul Preston, founder and president of the Movement for a New California State. We discuss how realistic the New California Movement actually is why God would be reintroduced into the preamble of the new state constitution, and how the Reynolds v. Sims 1964 Supreme Court decision undermined the U.S. lowercase r Republican model of governance, leading to the challenges facing many Californians today. Paul Preston, wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thank you for having me. So, Paul, you're the founder and president of the movement for a new California state. Um, and this might sound kind of outrageous to to many of our viewers right um can you tell me what this is all about well we're uh, actually forming the a, a new state from california we're in the process of uh, forming a new state from a pre-existing state and following the constitution our constitution and declaration of independence and bill of rights provides for us to form a new state when the citizens feel compelled to. And so right now, with uh, there's obviously a lot of things going on in California and have been going on in California. There's great unrest with Californians. And uh, we've managed to pull it together over the course of last several years, probably eight years, to actually get a cohesive state movement together. And there's been a number of other programs. You probably heard about six state, three state, that sort of thing. None of them were constitutional. They didn't pass constitutional muster. And our state uh, movement has passed constitutional muster. We've uh, seen all of our opposition fall off, basically, um, with their attempts at forming new states because they weren't following the Constitution. So we've adhered to the Constitution, and we're in the process of forming the 51st state. So California is economically the largest state in America. Right. I've read that it's probably, if, if it were alone, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, uh, why is it that you want to break that up? Well, the economy is not working for most Californians. It's working for very few at the top. That's really what it's coming down to. Um, the middle class has been squeezed out by overtaxation, overregulation. That's been a process that's been going on in California for really the last 25 years. And so now we're at the point where we just really have a, an elite upper class and a very poor uh, middle or lower class, if you'd say lower class. Uh, we have a, the highest poverty rate of any state. Our homelessness situation is just off the hook in both major places like San Francisco and really all throughout the state. If you, when you travel the state like I have, I've been to all 58 counties, poverty really is everywhere. And it's really unfortunate. But so our system and how we got there economically is very much broken. And uh, right now at this point in time in, in our state's history, there's, like I said, there's great turmoil. Part of that has been deriv derived from the California's Constitution. And the Constitution that we're technically working under, which is the playbook, you know, how, the, how is the state going to be run? The Constitution is your playbook. If you use sports, you have a playbook that you follow. And the Constitution has been amended in this state since 1879 um, more than 30 plus times through uh, propositions and things like that. And that's really had a detrimental effect upon the actual function and the basis for why they had the Constitution. And one of the things that they brought in starting in 1966 was a full-time legislature. Oh, right. Now, when you start to think about that, what could possibly go wrong in a state with a full-time legislature? which means that you cr have created an enormous bureaucracy and that enormous bureaucracy has has to do something. So what they do is they create laws. That's basically what they're there for. So in 1966, they brought in the, prof I call it the professional legislat legislature, which meant that the legislature was going to meet 11 months out of the year. Now, b prior to that, our legislature, like in the state of Texas, because we had similar constitutions at the time, we were only meeting once every two years as a legislature. But the, the boom, the explosion of the bureaucracy and the bureaucratic uh, monster, if you will, that we have today started back then. 
And that kind of folded into another problem, and that was a court decision called Reynolds versus Sims from 1964 that took effect in 1967. So by 1967, when Ronald Reagan was governor for the first year, because he was elected in 1966, we had this confluence in coming together of the Reynolds versus Sims decision and then also this, the situation going on with the full-time legislature. And so it, really we created this this monster of bureaucracy that we have today. So that's why the legislature can meet at will today in, in our term, in our modern day, 20, 2019, and pass a bill within a matter of a couple of days. And they're passing bill after bill after bill after bill. There was over 2,300 bills that were introduced just this legislative cycle. And they predict that there's gonna be about 1,500 of those are gonna be passed. That's just outrageous. And of course, when they're passed, you get the regulations, you get the fees, you get the, all the additional taxes, anything that goes with the bill, and then you get a bloated uh, bureaucracy, which takes energy and it takes money away from the private sector. So that's why businesses are fleeing California. And as we sit here in this room, I look around at the businesses and the signs that are up for lease around this area, beautiful area of California, but it's that way throughout most of California. Businesses cannot stand up to the high taxes, the high regulations and fees that are going on um, coming from, from Sacramento. So basically as we view it in New California, combine that with education, combine that with other parts of the economy, the overregulation, transportation, infrastructure, we take a look at California as a failed state at this point. And that's when we got together and said, there's got to be an answer to this. A lot of us uh, 10 years ago were saying, there's got to be a solution as to how we can make this change. And we looked at it and said, well, we'll pass a constitutional you know, proposition. And it's, we said, well, they've been doing that and ruining basically California through the propositions. Uh, what can we do? And said, well, the, the only thing that we really possibly can do uh, is to take a look at um, forming a new state. And what would that look like? And as we started to look at it more and more, it made a lot more sense to form a new state from a pre-existing state. And we, because of the attempts at trying to derail Reynolds versus Sims, it um, really looked like we, the only possible way we could do it, it successfully is by forming a new state. So we looked at that and said, okay, how can we do that? We looked at the tools which we had, which was the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights. There, the tools were there. The Founding Fathers put those tools to, in place for moments like this when a, a state was in the process of failing. And right now, economically, the economic tra trajectory for California is it's going to run out of money. It's at that point where Margaret Thatcher says, you know, the, the state California government is running out of other people's money. And that's going to happen real, much sooner than people think. And, you know, the, the reports we get from the field is that there's a lot of, um, I guess you'd say, um, people not being paid by the state right now as we speak. So that's called an indicator or a clue that, of the economic disadvantages that are going on from the state. They're not paying their bills. But the other part of it is, of course, what's going on to society in general. And when you start taking a look at the overregulation, you start looking at what's going on with crime. And crime in California, regardless of what you're hearing from the state, which we're look, you look at the st things from the state that come out and you, real, you research and you find out it's not really accurate. <laughs> the, they basically are trying to cover up a, a lot of the crime statistics, but crime is growing. And then we're finding out that a lot of the legislative st packages in, include packages are really kind of benefiting the criminal. So when you start taking a look at that, you realize that's failing. So, you know, our response is, well, we need a new constitution, period. We think that um, a fresh look at a, a new state, uh, as the Constitution provides, uh, is really the only option that we have left. When I was learning about the New California Movement, the thing that really struck me was how it's this kind of a rural interior versus coastal urban divide. Right. right. If you can kind of unpackage that for me a little bit, that would be helpful. And, and, and am I right? No, you're absolutely right, and that's the core of what we're doing. I mean, there's many core pieces of what we're doing, but this is actually the, the heart and, and soul, really, of what we're doing, because in the problems that we have all throughout the nation is you're having a centralization of power 
that's taking place right within the states themselves. But in Reynolds versus Sims, they decided that counties uh, being represented under the, the little federal model by senators would be best served if they were representing people only. So in other words, in rather than representing a county or the resources or the schools or the, you know, uh, ec the economy or everything that has to do with a county and the sovereignty of a county, they looked at it as a population grab. So in other words, senators should, should re you know, have an equal number of people that they represent and that way they can rule better, <laughs> you know, that, that was the thinking. And they didn't touch the federal model, which called for two senators per state because they wanted, the founders wanted states to have an equal balance of power when they got into the legislature as a bicameral. And in California, at the time that California was founded, they came up with a formula for 80 assembly members and 40 senators, primarily because we had about 40 counties at the time, so everybody got a, got a senator. And uh, when Reynolds versus Sims came along, they did away with that. They said that one person, one vote, that was their mantra. And so what they did is they divided up the senators in the states by districts, and they gave them numerous counties to represent, and, and they had a population they had to represent first. Well, you've got to think about that, because population was already being represented by the assembly or by the House of Representatives, whatever their state is. They represented the people. So now what you did is you gave the House of Representatives really more humans to be there to represent people as the senators. We have one senator here, and actually it's multiple counties that he represents. One senator in Senate District 1 represents 11 counties in California. And then down, if you go down to San Diego up to Los Angeles, you have 22 senators in just three counties. So the power in the Senate basically became concentrated in these ex very urbanized. Right, and what, it, what, it's, what it's become in most states of, of the United States is now you have a unicameral legislature. You really don't have the, the, the differential, the differences in the power sharing that were in, in, inherent in a bicameral legislature that had equal power the, with the senators representing counties, which represented all the resource, all the commerce, all the things that go into counties. You, you did away with that. And so that's what's collapsed the system into power, uh, you know, power spots, centralized governance in the states. In California, you've got Los Angeles, you've got San Francisco and Sacramento. Those are the three power places. If you take a look at New York and Manhattan in upstate, it's all concentrated in Manhattan because all the senators represent people in Manhattan, not in the counties, in the counties that are out there in, in, in upstate New York. If you take a look at Illinois, it, Chicago as is the most populous, Cook County in Chicago is the most populous state. So it has all the resources and all the rural areas of Chicago don't have those resources and they're fighting their you know they've actually started a new Illinois movement based upon our model because in our model we restore the one senator for one county situation we bring we bring that back and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second you're actually challenging Reynolds versus Sims absolutely and there's a unique way and that's not just for California that's for it's for other states right yeah, and there's n numerous movements that have now developed that uh, we're that people are calling us and using us as a resource. Uh, New Illinois is, is really the one that's the most furthest along. They actually have a resolution before their their uh, state uh, assembly right now that they're bringing out. Uh, then you have New Hawaii. They want to join. We actually had New Nevada actually did declare independence, and they're working on getting their counties together. And New Oregon and New Washington are, have shown interest and they want to be a part of this. So it's growing is what's happening. And there is a new New York uh, group of people too. You know, aside from, you know, staging a coup or something like that, it doesn't sound like that's anything like what you're planning to do. No. It sounds like you're planning to, you know, use the, use the, um, the rules in the Constitution and, uh, and uh, legislative approaches to do this. It seems like you would actually need the California legislature to pass legislation to allow this to happen. So forgive me for being skeptical, but I don't see that happening. No. Well, it it will, 
and um, they're they're in an impossible situation. We understand that, and we're basically here to help them more than than hurt them or to or to bury them or something like that. But the the uh, eco the economy for California is tumbling so far out of control. They need help, and we understand that. Um, but with the Reynolds versus Sims decision and going in conflict with a big federal model that was put down to the little federal model. We do have that opportunity because we are following the Constitution. I want to speak about that for a second because this is really important that we follow the Constitution in New California and that we also have declared that we are going to be a part of the United States and be under the auspices of the United States Constitution and we will follow those laws um, as opposed to other movements that haven't done that. And of course, that's where you get into things like coup. You know, you mentioned coups because um, when you start to listen to some of the voices in, of leadership in those groups, they're really talking about coups because they're not talking about using the, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution as the tool to form a new state. And that's where the Founding Fathers knew there would be moments like this if you have a, a, a tyrant in a given state as a governor, you have tyranny that's washed, the people can do something about it. So what the Constitution calls for in Article 4, Section 3 is that the people can form a state from a pre-existing state by directly going at the legislature and dealing with the legislature concerned. So we have an opportunity as citizens to not appeal to our state representatives in our own districts per se, um, but as a whole, as a whole group of counties which we have represented, we, are, we don't work with the governor. The governor is irrelevant in the process, and the executive branch is irrelevant in the process, and the courts are irre irrelevant in the process of getting approval, seeking approval of the state legislature. So that is our goal, is that we will be working with, hands-on, with the state legislature as citizens from the counties concerned. And that's how we will get approval. And it's a resolution that has to be passed in the Assembly and also in the Senate. And we think that the circumstances are coming together quite nicely right now for those events to take place. And they are, they're taking place right now. We've, we've already had some discussions with state legislators. We're not dealing with government agencies uh, or even at the county level because they're irrelevant in the process. We want to get their support ultimately. And that's what we want is their support, but we're not going to go actively, actively after it. And the reason being is that they're part of the problem. You know, the founding fathers don't want us to work with the problem makers <laughs> if you're forming a new state. You know, because they, you, know, you want to be free from that and your, your opportunity to do so is to work directly with the legislators concerned. After that, we go to the Congress. We'll get approval, and I'll explain that in a second. But then we, the next step, step of Article 4, Section 3 is that we seek approval from the Congress. And we've already started that process as well. We're, we're in contact with certain members of Congress at this point in time. And we are absolutely being overwhelmed with support. At, at this point, we're actually getting overwhelming support from the people that we're talking with. Um, and we're finding overwhelming support with the general public when we go out and meet with them. Uh, we're getting more and more proactive in that regard. But getting back to the point about the state legislature, we understand uh, the positions they're going to be in because there won't be the money that they thought that there was going to be. Um, and we're here basically not to just help ourselves out and improve our, you know, our lot as new Californians in the rural area because that's our focus. We're here to help them too. So we want to make it a win-win situation at the state separation. But the big thing that we're doing is that divide of rural versus urban. And that is the problem with Reynolds versus Sims because, you know, as I was talking about before, you had that situation with one senator representing 11 counties. There's no representation. We bring that all back. We return that because in our state formation process, we're following in the historical footsteps of three other states who did this before. It's only been tried three times. And the last time was with West Virginia at the time of the Civil War. In the West Virginia situation, um, they followed the other models that they saw and they got together with their own people in their own counties. Counties did the work. Um, and the, the committees in the counties did all the, all the work with the legislature. They were the ones meeting with the legislatures. But in the case of West Virginia, it was a very unique case. Uh, there was a great deal of, uh, obviously, animosity being in 
you know, the Civil War was at hand. In fact, there was a lot of bloodletting in, in Virginia and in West Virginia at the time when all this was happening, actually. But the West Virginians did not want to become part of the plantation mentality of the South. So they did not want to secede from the Union as Virginia did. And so they were forming their own state, built more in the reflection of Ohio and, and Pennsylvania. And so when they came to the point where they were going to actually declare the, the separation and work with the legislature, Virginia pulled away and became part of the South, leaving them high and dry. So they met and they said, what are we going to do about this? They went to the Congress and the Congress said, no, we, you can't be a state or you can't approach us until you satisfy Article 4, Section 3 of the Constitution. You have to work with the state legislature. And uh, so what happened was uh, one of the guys stood up and said, Pierpont was his name, he raised his hand and said, I'll be the governor of the restored government of Virginia. <laughs> and everybody looked around at him like he's crazy. And he said, no, I'll, I'll do that. And you and you and you can be a lieutenant governor and a secretary. So he, he, they put together a, a, a makeshift government. And they called it the restored government of Virginia. They appealed to the Congress, and the Congress let them in. And so it was at that point that West Virginia went to the restored government of Virginia, and they got the authority, they got a resolution passed that allowed them to go on to the Congress. So by 18, that was in 1861, 62, by 1863, the Congress had granted them statehood. Now we are in the exact same situation in California. There is so much tension. We don't know what's going to happen with the economy. We don't want, there's civil unrest brewing. You know, we have the sanctuary state thing going on. And one of the arguments that we make in, there's three major arguments that we make for statehood in New California. One, and that this all hinges on Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution, that's the Guarantee Clause that one, we are not being given a representative government. In other words, a Republican form of government. That's exactly what it states. So there's some kind of, you know, you mentioned tyranny earlier. So this is kind of the tyranny of the majority being enforced on everyone? Right, that, okay. it, of the minority, actually. It's the legislators and those leaders that are foisting the tyranny upon us. And they're using a system that doesn't have a Republican form of government. See, the United States and, and California, all the states, are not democracies. We hear the term democracy being used all the time, but a do democracy is a dictatorship. So when they broke down the little federal model, and we got Reynolds versus Sims, and the senators all became representatives, literally, of people, just like the assembly member, then you pulled all that power together for the people and not for the resources. So that's a tyranny, and that's a democracy. You, d you lost the power of the representation of the, of the counties, and you gave this, the representatives of the people more power. And the Founding Fathers did not want that. They understood what a tyranny was, and that if you had all your power concentration, concentrated in a centralized area, then all the people in the rural areas, all the people with the natural resources, and all the natural resources would soon come under the power of just the people. I mean, one man can't represent 11 counties properly for the resources, that's a fact. So th this is what we have now, is that tyranny that's here, and they're passing laws that are very egregious. They're, they're, they're not guaranteeing our safety in, in public here in, in California any longer. We're certainly not free from invasion. I mean, when the, when the, the government of California openly induces and offers enticements for people to come swarming across our borders, that's not protecting us from invasion, which is the second guarantee in the Guarantee Clause. The third one is to keep us free from um, civil unrest and, and uh, freedom from violence. And those are the three elements, and right now that's not, being, that's not happening. You can ask Kate Steinle's family if that's happening. If you take a look at the sanctuary state status, um, it's not it's not constitutional by any stretch of the imagination and this government has been warned by the the current president and the current executive um, about violations of article 6 which is the supremacy clause so those are the three elements that we're arguing is that we are not being guaranteed a Republican form of government, we're not being guaranteed freedom from invasion, and we're not being guaranteed against domestic violence. So all those are blown up, and that's where we're coming from. Now, how are we gonna get that back? We're gonna be the first state since West Virginia to follow the model into statehood. 
and we're following pretty much their model. In fact, we've had a declaration of independence. We declared our independence on January 15, 2018, which is exactly what we should be doing. All the states, all the countries around the new world that declared their independence did that first before they became a nation or a state. And then the other part of it is um, we are in the process of not only following that model, we know we're going to get there because, and this is the hook for Reynolds versus Sims. The last state to come into this union by territory was Hawaii. That was 1959, predating Reynolds versus Sims. We are coming in post-dating Reynolds versus Sims, and what we have done already is we have to set up our own government. We have asked our county chairman to assign, to select and elect a senator for each county. So we've already, dealt, we've already got our senators in place, and we've got two assembly members as a startup for a government. And we're going to challenge Reynolds versus Sims because we believe that we have a 10th Amendment right which supersedes that decision to have representation the way we deem it to be effective for our state. It's very interesting. So the, the big question in my mind at this point is, how can you be sure that what you're doing is actually representing the will of the Californians that are living in all these rural counties that we're, we're, are looking to, to form this new state? Well, and that's really, um, that's a timing issue, actually. I think five years ago, people would be scoffing and laughing at this. And, of course, I was with other organizations at the time because we had this vision. We could see that forming a state and setting up new borders and joining the union, becoming a, an additional state in the union of 50, now becoming 51, would strengthen the whole unity of these 50 other states and our own. And in a time of the globalist, and the globalists want to dissolve boundaries, especially California borders, it's pretty well known. This wasn't really featured years ago. And now, all of a sudden, people are understanding there are these globalists who have these ill intent for our country. And um, they're, they're actually, it's actually working. And you can see that working going effect with uh, jobs leaving our country. The president has brought a lot of that back now. But the destabilization of our borders, which is where we're at right now, is a big part. It's a values thing, basically, right? It's people seeing a different vision for the future of right. the state, of the country. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But how can, how, how is it, you, you said it's a timing issue. How is it that all of these, the, let's say the new representatives, how are, how are they and you connecting with the people? Well, and that's the big quest that we're on right now. Right. When we first started uh, New California and, and how we went about it, we, we, we asked counties to commit by signing documents and so on. We asked the representatives to, as com county chair, and then become senators. We're doing that r outreach right now. This is where we're going to start. Really, we've been doing a lot of it, but we're doing more of it now. We've we've got the counties. I don't think we're going to grow any more by beyond the 52 whole or part of the counties. Now keep this in mind: L.A. County is part of New California, the rural area of L.A. County, which is the northern tier uh, assembly districts 36 and 38. And the reason is it's rural. And so you can propose any border you want. So all the rural areas that of, are of California, which is about 85% of the land mass, you'll have about 18 million people versus 21 million people in the LA basin, in San Francisco and Sacramento. Um, we have population parity, but it's that population of, of people, the 18 million that we're appealing to. And so far we've gotten, any place we go, we have gotten massive outreach and support success. I mean, it's just when they hear about it. You know, we've been kind of keeping it low right now because we're building and we're, we're, we're getting... Basically, support. you've built the infrastructure right. for all of this to basically come into place, and now you're working to let people know that this is even a possibility, because I suspect right. most for most folks, this is just not even in their realm of conception, right? Well, you know, it's it, what we're getting now uh, we got laughed at, scoffed at. No, no one's doing that now. No, no, no. People are going, come here and tell us more. We want to know more. And um, it's, it's resonating. And it's a timing issue. And we knew it would be a timing issue. We, we planned it years in advance to be here right now at this point in time. And we're here. And it's, it's working. Because things have kind of gotten to that point right. where something may turn around or something may change. Right. Well, people, I think, sense that, um, you know, we just, what we just witnessed with the president in 
I never thought we'd ever see something like that. And I was around when Kennedy was assassinated, and everybody said that was a coup. Well, that was, it was. It was an attempted power play, and time and history are showing that. But really, right in front of our faces, we have seen really the first ever coup d'etat attempt on a sitting president. Actually, wasn't even seated to be on the, when the whole thing started, as we're finding out. I mean, this is just outrageous times. So you're talking see, about, you know, Spygate, Russia all that, collusion, yeah, this all whole that round, stuff, right. right? All that stuff. And um, one of the things that I do a radio show called Agenda 21 Radio, and I've been doing this for years as a result of my interpretation of events and seeing these kind of things starting to move forward, the rise of the totalitarians, the globalists, and things like that. And now they've risen, and now they're being confronted. And as with all totalitarians, and I'm sure you understand this, they overplay their hands. And you've seen them overplay their hands, I think, with President Obama, and then the, the, as things moved on and progressed. That's why I say we could see this coming. It's pretty obvious if you looked at the Cold War situation or lived through all that, um, it was going to happen here. It was bound to, and it has happened, and now the tide has turned. But the whole Spygate thing, as it's being known now, was clearly um, a, a real official coup d'etat. And so... Attempt. Attempt. Yeah. Attempt. <laughs> but see, that's played into what's happening in California and the other states because people are waking up to this whole thing like, wait a minute, why back in the 60s did they come up with Reynolds versus Sim to concentrate all the powers in the state's centralized government, which of course we all know that it happens with centralized government. It, it never works. The day autonomous counties which is the root of all liberty and freedom in the United States is really where it's at. So the rural areas, their balance of power was taken away and this, we got the power that was sucked in. So that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing with rural versus urban and that's the core essence of what we're doing. So we have all these counties, we're doing the outreach right, outreach, outreach right now. We've had three constitutional conventions. We passed numerous resolutions, and the resolutions that we passed, the first and one of the first ones we passed was to accept the Declaration of Independence that we put out. The next one was to put um, God in the preamble, and then we came up with a third resolution. This was in the second constitutional convention to cover our bases because if there is an insurrection. And if the president has to sign the Insurrection Act and there is an actual insurrection, we put out already a resolution and mailed it to him, letting him know that we would form a restored California government, just like there would be if something happened to the California government. And then we passed additional resolutions that we actually have presented to the president. And those resolutions are freedom from or get to, to guarantee that he has to guarantee. The President of the United States, he swears an oath, and the President has to guarantee. And this is what people don't understand, I think, about the President and the border and all this stuff. He has sworn an oath that he has to protect the borders. That's his job. And, and, and that's the first, the second thing it says in that guarantee clause, not only does he have to guarantee a Republican form of government, which many states don't have right now, but he has to guarantee us freedom from invasion and then domestic violence. And that's his job, that's his responsibility. So we passed three resolutions requesting that he do that. And we sent those to him and uh, he's got possession of them today. One last question. Why is it so important to you to put God back in the preamble? Well, the, 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 the founders were godly people. And uh, they were Christian faith and they were Protestants. Most of them were Protestants. And the, uh, you take a look at the Declaration of Independence, um, there were 56 founders who wrote the Declaration, who were part of it. Uh, and certainly Thomas Jefferson gets a lot of plaudits, but 56 of, 56 of the founders, 54 were Protestants. And two, one was a Catholic and one was a Jew. And when we did that, we thought, wait a minute, you know, a lot of people don't understand that through every constitution in every one of the 50 states, they mentioned God in the very first part of their constitution, in the preamble. So we're doing the same thing. We're being consistent. Um, we want to follow in the footsteps of the other founders of all the other states and also our founding fathers because we look at the world that they created with their faith and look at the United States of America, what it's been. And it's all been attacked. Right now, you, I used to be in education. I was an educator for 41 years, custodian to superintendent. 
and I saw the wiping out of constitutional concepts in the education systems to where our constitution, that's another part of our education system, is a, is a failing system and people don't understand how the constitution works and why it should work. So that was a very important element to put that in there. Um, the other resolutions, of course, passed without any problem, but the God uh, uh, mention was a very, very important one for all of us because I think we need to go back to that. Uh, and we need to go back to our roots and our heritage as a, as a nation because it, it's worked very, very well. It's the only model for freedom and liberty that's out there, and we have to keep it healthy. And to keep it healthy means that we're going to grow a new state and add to the states that are already in this union of 50. We'll be the 51st state, New California. Paul Preston, I'm very excited to learn what comes next with your movement. Thank you for having me.